OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for. Right, welcome along to this week's edition of the OTB Culture Hall of Fame. It's brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show, Gangs of London, on the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which also has a 14-day free trial that you can avail of. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had some great guests. Stephanie Preisner was on talking about the US office. We had Kenny Cunningham on talking about Faulty Towers. We had Louisa Harland from Dairy Girls on talking about Kamara. And last week, Paul Howard put Columbo into the OTB Culture Hall of Fame. So it has been a disparate group. And I'm delighted to say this week, we've got Lenny Abramson with us. Lenny, how the hell are you? I'm not too bad at all, Jared. Nice to be talking to you both. You've caught lightning in a bottle. That is a nice way to put it. Um, it seems so. Yeah, it's been a mad, a really, really mad, I think three weeks pretty much now since the show first came out on the BBC. And I can say hand on heart that none of us had any idea that it would become so, I don't know what, how to even describe it, but it's sort of this, yeah, it's just became very big and people talking about it and making memes about it. And yeah, it's amazing. Um. Was there a point where you kind of went, oh, Andrew Lloyd Webber is just tweeting my star and wants him to get involved in a sing-along? Or was it Chloe Kardashian last night going, I want season two? When did you kind of pinch yourself and go, what, what happened here? Yeah, it was, it was actually, it was, it was all of those things. And it was quite quick because I remember the day that it came out, which was a Sunday on the BBC iPlayer. And much as you might want to tell yourself that you're, you're not going to kind of, you're just going to be chilled about it. Of course, you're checking social media like crazy to see what people's reactions are and the reactions were unbelievably strong straight away people were watching it in a day and it just seemed to become this thing and I think after about two days of that I thought to myself and I was I, I said to my wife I actually think this I honestly had this feeling for the first time in my life am I actually dreaming this because the the comments were sort of this is the best thing I've ever seen in my entire life um you know, it was all these things that you might write if you were, or you might daydream, some people were saying. And so I thought, and I woke up about three days later and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do something complete. I'm not even going to check social media. And I thought, I'll listen to a podcast. And I sometimes listen to the BBC Corona cast, which is all their top journalists. I thought, well, I'll just listen to some miserable news from Britain and that will bring me down. And the title was Normal People and Something Else. And the first 10 minutes were dedicated to them talking about how much they've been watching normal people over the weekend. So yeah, that was the point at which I thought this has just gone a bit weird. You're, you must be the only person in the entire world who's actually gone to seek out grim news uh, to actually yeah. try and give you some sense of normality during this whole thing. Totally, because I'm, I'm not used to feeling, I'm not, I, I'm a, I, I tend to be, I'm most at home in a slightly miserable frame <laughs> of mind. So I wanted to go back to my sort of heartland. And uh, yeah, sadly, that was not possible. Then it's, it's unbelievable. It's like, I, it, I, can you put your finger on why people feel so strongly about this? Why we're all sitting here uh, trying to contain ourselves by not binging it too quickly, feeling so passionately about the two main characters, about this entire television show. Why did this happen for, for, for the audience? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, first and foremost, it's Sally. You know, it's the book. And the feeling I had when I read the book, which was a sort of, sense of like proper intimacy with these characters you know just just like I, I don't know it it was it's deceptively simple the way she writes and she goes really deep and and she appears just to be sort of effortlessly describing what people are doing and thinking and I, and I don't know the, the effect of the book was very strong and it, it, it and what we had to do was to try to preserve that in a very different medium um so there's that and then I think it's also got to do with lockdown probably to some extent I mean I think people are probably um, feeling that bit more emotionally uh, open or a li little bit raw or also that whole idea of intimacy for a lot of people, which has been taken away by this, um, is such a kind of charged one. I think there's that. And I think, I mean, the, the quality of the show, you know, the cast are incredible. And, and maybe the one thing I think that's probably, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, it's like we've managed to somehow sneak in under the radar a, a sort of art house um, like sensibility, you know? And, and this wasn't, there was no, this is, I just did it the way I wanted to do it. But 
looking back on it, you think there's some odd thing, which is the combination of this very compelling story and the moment that it lands. nuanced and delicate than is the norm on television and they didn't sort of flick it off because it has the weight of the book behind it and because it's well it's a love story and that in itself is a strong engine and so in the end people the reactions that you get sometimes on social media it's like somebody every time a film or a piece of television that speaks in a sort of more or less honest voice or a different voice to the one that they're used to if that doesn't sound sort of to big a claim and and I feel that that might be it that it's sort of oh wow you because I've had those feelings from films all my life but they've tended to be the sorts of films that aren't massively mainstream and this carries that into a, a more mainstream environment somehow. I, I'd be keen to hear what, what, what those sort of films are because certainly from episode one I'm thinking Richard Linklater's Before Sunrise straight away that is the mood I get yeah. which is quite a statement. I don't think it's hyperbole, Lenny. I think even in a year's time, I'll think that. And I think a lot of people will think that uh, down the line as well, because this sort of format, uh, delving yourself into that, especially on mainstream television, it could blow up in your face. So like, wh oh, why yeah. do you think it is like, I, I don't know, just being on that level immediately, I, it just really stuck out to me that this was something special. Thank you. I mean, I think, yeah, there is, there's definitely the before um, series is in there for sure. And there's bit of there's little bits of um, I don't know um, some little bits of Gus Van Sant, uh, you know, in 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 places maybe as well. And I'm trying. I was trying to think of um, just a sort of tradition of 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 of, of naturalism with that kind of poetic um, uh, like accent sometimes, which which for me is the kind of it's where I tend to be drawn as a filmmaker it's what my sort of natural space to work in is and I think with this we did talk about it as we went you know and, and the only pressure I felt at all from and we had really good executives on this both from the BBC and Hulu but the only pressure that ever came was around the beginning the very beginning because people on you know in television land everybody worries about somebody just tuning out straight away because there's so much more there's so much other stuff you could watch. So there's the finger on the trigger of the remote control. You don't have that problem in a cinema. You've got people captive for a little while anyway. And so people really felt, well, does it need to be a bit hookier, at least at the beginning, and a little bit sort of glossier and a bit more like, let's tell the audience what sort of thing this is going to be so that they can rub their hands together and sit back and, and go, okay, I'm safe. But our feeling was, and we weren't like, it wasn't you know, some taking some moral high ground. It was just a, a deeper sense that if you did that, the rest of the episode and the rest of the series would sort of feel like an odd disappointment mm -hmm. or a, a kind of a shift in some odd shift. That, that the only way to do this was to tell it truthfully, skillfully, and trust that people would hold with it, which is why we felt, I think all of us felt, that it would be strongly reviewed um, but unreasonable in terms of its audience reaction. So that was the mood we, we had when we went into those first days, which was why the sort of explosion was so mad. I mean, it really did not, it, it totally took us by surprise. Does this speak to a change in audiences that <clears throat> they, they've been conditioned to spend much longer now with a box set where if, if you look at a lot of box sets, you could, uh, or, or um, you know, any of those long documentaries mm. could actually generally tend to be two or three episodes less, but people watch them to the end because they yeah. decide that they're, they're part of this. Tiger King is a perfect example where yeah. it came out, everybody watched it in one weekend and you get to the far side of it and you're like, that was really a 90 minute film that they made seven or eight episodes out of. Totally. And but there's it, a podcast thing in there as well. Like you'll get these long form podcasts where they really, really eke it out you know, um, and you think, well, this could have been done in two or three. But I think you're right in the sense that I think we always, I mean, audiences are traditionally underestimated. That is, I mean, that's something that people on my side of the camera say all the time to um, funders and, and, and studios, you know, that people are more, much more capable of, of experiencing things, uh, subtle things than you give them credit for. Um, 
and I think having said that, expectation is a huge part of it. And I was saying to myself and Ed Guiney, who's the producer and somebody I've worked with all of my career, we were just saying that if you tried to, to make normal people as a film, you would have been told straight away, okay, this is a small art house release, guaranteed. Think about what's in the cinema at any given time. You know that this is IFI plus a few other cinemas. Um, and actually, the, the odd thing is that the distributors who would say that to you would probably be right that if you released it really broadly, it would die in the cinema in a way that it doesn't on TV. And I don't quite, and I think that's because, and it's a slight worry, it's a big worry, really. I think people have sort of now decided that the big crash bang wallop tent pole experience is what the cinema's for. And television is where you can meander and dive into the more, into the richer territory. And I, I, I hate to see that happen, but it seems to be what's happening. I would love to watch normal people on the big screen. After, after saying that right there. And I think anybody who's out there would say the exact same thing. It's, you're right though, it, it, is, it, it does seem to be the way that studios will fund things that are bigger because you've got more of a canvas right in front of you. Yeah, exactly. And to get people out of their houses, the sense is um, it, they won't go to, I mean, it's not completely true and things do buck that trend, but the, the bottom line is for, for cinema, if you want to make something complex or you know, low key maybe is the right word. Unless it gets major nominations, it's really hard to get it through to an audience. You're, as, as a filmmaker who makes movies, that's something that you're concerned about. Is there, is there, is the other side of that coin though, that this top of television now is so broad that you can actually really delve into stuff in a way that, you know, a short normal people on the big screen would be really good, but short. And now, yes. who knows? Maybe Chloe Kardashian gets her second season. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and and I, if if I'm not here to to facilitate Chloe's entertainment, I don't know what I'm here to. Do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but you're right because I mean we didn't you know we didn't choose television for this because we thought oh, I would never fly in the cinema. We chose it because we felt it was the right. Um, place and and for exactly the reason you're talking about it needs because it's quite it's odd actually it, it sort of goes against what you might initially think because it's quite slight in a sense like there's no major dramatic you know um center to it it's just this study of this ebb and flow in a relationship putting it into a short sort of feature form would cr would force you into finding an arc that was a bit artificial whereas in this case we could really each episode study um, that phase of their relationship, give it space, give it time. And like, in the end, it feels like it's as substantial an experience as reading the novel, which I don't think we would have managed to do in a cinema form. So yes, you're right. Like, I think what I'm feeling now is, okay, there are challenges in making films for this big screen, which I, I still, I'm still, intending every bit as much to do but actually television isn't some sort of second best it's just different and you can do amazing things there um like which you could i mean that which would have been impossible 10 15 well 20 years ago for sure we've spoken before about your emil griffith project it does does something like the success of this change how you frame that in your head and suddenly you think actually that's a three parts uh, 90 minute or in, in that case, no, but there are other things that I've been doing where I do think, actually, yes, that could be a three-part. Um, there, like, there's, there are a couple of projects which are really, I don't know, there's, a, there's also, like, there's a whole kind of, the way stuff's funded and the, the kind of power that the big streamers have in terms of, like, just how much money they have to spend and the way they calculate success versus a cinema release. You know, they calculate, the streamers calculate success. Um, it's not like people they don't pay to see that specific thing. They're keeping a large base of subscribers um, loyal, you know, and they're attracting more subscribers, which has a different sort of um, incentive for them. And it's very different how they calculate success. A film is like brutal. It's just that box office, you know, versus the cost. It's really hard. But, okay, so leaving that, as, so there are projects where you go, man, that may be too big, oddly enough, to do as a film because it's, it's um, a difficult project and it's, and it's expensive, which is that those two things make a film very hard. 
Whereas actually, if it's pres if it's a prestige piece of work, a streamer might be interested in it for all sorts of reasons. So you look at Roma, um, or you look at um, The Irishman by Scorsese, projects which are, you know, particularly Roma, very hard in the cinema space because it's a big, big, um, serious study of something. But actually, it became this huge phenomenon on Netflix because, I don't know, because it just operates differently there. So, so yeah, I think with Emil, though, just to go back to your question, it, for me, is quintessentially a film because it, for, like, it's a study. Of, to do it justice, to do him justice, it needs to, it, for me, it needs to have a sort of monumental feeling. Like, I think his life was, 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 in some particular way, kind of enormous in terms of its significance, you know, like both, um, like uh, thinking about race, thinking about sexuality, thinking about like American mid-century and just the, the operatic tragedy of what happened um, with, between him and Benny Perrette. It feels to me like that, that, that can have that setting, that kind of super concentrated setting of the film is right. But then there are other things where, I think, you know, yes, for, for both practical, financial, and also aesthetic reasons, television might be the thing. It's going to be really interesting to see how that all, um, what the art forms evolve into over the yes. next period of time. Um, one of the other things that's been really gratifying about this has been the rest of the world learning our cultural language, <laughs> um, you know, the devs and uh, Gaelic football yeah. and, uh, and Trinity. Um, that was obviously very important like this was this was a discernibly this is set in ireland and yes it's not set anywhere else and when we were growing up we we watched american stuff and high school and english stuff and it was all very alien and, yeah. and yet the stories are kind of fairly similar but it turns out the universal teenage experience the universal early 20s experience love is love yes i mean it, it may, it's just a brilliant thing when I think about what you were saying, like, do you remember, like, when I was a kid, anyway, if, if anybody on British media or America mentioned Ireland or said something about Dublin, you go, oh, my God, we exist. There's a, yeah. we've been validated in that moment. Um, and to think that there's a sort of an Irish show which set, you know, like, it's very unapologetically Irish. Like, we didn't change any of the language. We didn't soften the accents or anything think that that can travel is amazing and is a sign of sort of a big shift I think culturally um but it was so it was important to us to keep it authentic and and I have to say to be fair to the American um sort of streamer and to the BBC to Hulu and the BBC there was never any pressure to you know change grinds to something else or you know find ways of explaining the devs or you know, or any worries about showing the GAA. So that was like, it just, yeah, I, f I felt like we'd come out of something, uh, do you know, th th that idea that you could tell, I mean, it blows my mind really that, that we have this effectively fairly intimate Irish story. Um, and it's not, ma it's not people coming in and making a, a sort of version of Ireland. It's, it's we're, you know, it's our own reflection. And that that can travel to teenagers and older people in you know the Midwest is kind of amazing to me. The GA aspect of it is obviously something that we've been talking about. Um, uh, Owen gave his um, blow by blow exactly of how it happened, and that I conversation remember. with Malachi Clerk had happened on Twitter where it did emerge. In fact, that um, this isn't the first scene that we see where Connell scores a goal. Uh, it's actually the third or fourth. Yeah. You, you just yesterday because of the yeah. force of public opinion, you were forced to uh, release the rushes. So here, yes. here we go. What happened? So yeah, we're thinking brilliant. We've got, we've got it all work beautifully. And then that fabulous save, which you can see Paul, he's going, he's going, how did he? Yeah, and then, now this wasn't a great shot. <laughs> and, and <laughs> what's funny is we said, like I said, to him, Sorry. I said, look, yeah, try and save it, you know, because it'll look ter it looks terrible if you if, if if you're letting it in. So go for it. Thinking that, given that we put Paul in a position where we knew he was going to be just a few yards away with an open, uh, you know, with a clear shot, it would be fine. And then he pulls off two great saves, and I had to say to him, look, I'm 
really sorry, but because we, we had this thing I haven't said on Twitter. That day there was a terrible storm and we could see the clouds coming in. And it was just this general fear that we wouldn't get the shot. So I said, look, just, just for this one, <laughs> like, you know, please don't save it. And then I felt really bad that he was getting all this, um, oh, the keepers at fault stuff. So <laughs> Nathan Nugent, who's this, the brilliant editor that I work with, uh, sent me, he said yesterday, I found the rushes of the, of the real, of the saves. And I said, yeah, come on, let's, we'll, 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 let's put this poor guy out of his misery. How good a footballer is Paul Meskel in reality when he's on the spot like that? He's very good. I mean, he was like, he's rusty and he hasn't played for a while. But as soon as he got the ball into his hands, you could just, and it's odd, like, because he's, he's the gentlest person and he's incredibly generous with other actors. And, and if he had, like, if he's doing, if he, if he feels like a scene should go a certain way and another actor is playing it differently, he'd never, like, in quotes, pull rank as the, as the lead. He'd always, like, be interested in the discussion. However, when we're shooting the GAA stuff, it was like a whole different person comes out. And it's like, um, you know, whispering in my ear, that lad can't play again. You know, <laughs> going, Whoa, whoa, where did that come from? And it's like that thing of sport, just, it's just the competitive thing would come up in him straight away. And you could see that he was a real player. Do you think you could have made this if somebody outshone Paul Meskel in the audition, but wasn't as good at GEA as him. <laughs> I think we would have done something different with that scene. I mean, we might have done it in a more impressionistic way. What was really nice about this is we could actually stage it like a real game and know that he'd look okay. Um, like when, when I did what Richard did, I think Jack Rayner would be the first to see not a rugby player. And so even though there were ideas early on that we would see rugby um, in, the, in the show, for various reasons, I took that out. Uh, but one of them was I just thought, like, unless the person really can play, you're going to end up with Escape to Victory or, you know, or Invictus or something. Which is like, <laughs> the pain of that would be too much to bear. <laughs> uh, Can I just ask as well, Lenny, just like, it's very obvious what the, the, the on-pitch uh, depiction of GEA is. And again, it's, it's brilliant. But the off-screen depiction of the GEA is quite interesting as well, and not the GEA as a whole. I mean, the, the rural young fella who plays GEA uh, and what that says uh, about the young Irish male. I mean, mm-hmm. we see a conflict with Connell so many times uh, in your episodes early in uh, mm-hmm. the season and, and what that says uh, about masculinity. I'd, I'd be just keen to, to get your thoughts on that and what Connell tells us uh, about the young people in our own country. Well, it, it is. I mean, I think it's great that in the last few years there's been more of a conversation where where people, even, you know, young um, guys in sport are prepared to talk about, you know, difficulties they might have had or mental health problems or stuff that every human being has to go through. And you can feel at the taboo around that's kind of breaking down, which is very healthy. Um, but of course, it's not completely broken down. And you see in, in Connell that kind of conflict between a, a person who, and I've always been interested, I think one of the things that drew me to this book was I've always been interested in characters who, who are successful or liked, but don't understand why. That I think is a really interesting, it, it's, it's a sort of an odd position that, that again, Richard has in what Richard did, which is to kind of be the person that everybody looks to is a very odd thing if you don't feel internally like you sort of understand what that's about or that you can carry it in a way that convinces yourself and so paul paul's character in in normal people is afraid of all sorts of things and and at the same time kind of tied in and 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 kind of caught in this uh model of how he should behave as a as a young irish male and sports definitely part of that you know i mean the thing is i think as we always talked about it uh, paul and i he loves the sport it's not that's not a performance mm. and that's one place he's able to like actually oddly enough it's the physical where he feels most comfortable with her and with sport you know both those that, that's like he he knows himself there but outside of that he's very lost uh, i i think it's probably part of a this Sally's novel and, and, and the show is part of a movement where you can see, and I hope it filters through all kind of aspects of society where young men don't feel imprisoned by the idea of uh, masculinity, you know, where they feel that that's a broader 
space to operate in where you can be um you can be unwell or you can be worried or you can you know you can be sort of uh, low and that that's okay um and i you know my my sense of the gaa generally because uh my my son plays um uh, you know he's 12 and he's you know, he's about to be 12 and he plays and he's played in the club since he's about 6 and i didn't grow up with gaa but i've been but i i realized as 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 time went on you know with with him just how good the the organization is and and how kind of positive it is in the lives of of the kids that are doing it so it was nice to be able to bring that to the screen and and just you know like show it well like shoot it well just that thing of you know i've never seen it on telly before done you know in drama like that so it was just nice to be able to do it give it the treatment and do it properly why did you change it from soccer to ga what was the impetus for that just felt it was more interesting to see um and actually why not because it's going to make something international um and you know let's make it as 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 unique as possible i think it was totally valid like sally's choice of soccer was um she knows that soccer is a you know strong in sligo and and so it was totally um valid but i just thought well why don't for the sake of this show let's make it gaa it was kind of my own thing as well my own sort of liking of of the organization and and also paul you know if you have a guy who's played at a level it would be sort of crazy to not make use of that how big is the role of the director in creating an unbelievable on-string chemistry between two actors i think you can blow it as a director mm. And I've seen things where people I know, like where it really is good and it's been ruined or there's just not the same sort of, it's not looked at in the right way, but you can't create it. You can't, you know, and, and what happens if it's not there, if it's not really there is you have to do more work as a director to explain to the audience that what's happening is a deep attraction. You know what I mean? You have to give them those markers. You have to say, um the, you know you become much more active in a bad way as a storyteller in other words you're sort of telling people how they should think for, use, depending on you know using all sorts of devices like music the way things are shot use of sort of uh, patterns of cuts around looks and things like that which just make it very like uh they met and they were instantly attractive is what you're saying to the audience whereas if there is that chemistry and it's not and i should say this because it's really important to say it's not that the two of them are it's not that Paul and Daisy are romantically attracted to each other. It's actually, it's a creative kind of chemistry. It's a spark and a play and a thing they do that is just like, you know, in the same way that great dancers can, can sell a, a, a dance because they're tuned into each other. It's the same with the actors. Like, so people always think, oh, if it's like that on screen, then they must be mad about each other off screen. It's not like that. I mean, that can happen. But in this case, it was just like, a brilliant creative partnership like you know musicians playing together or something like that and um and once that's there i think this the skill of the director is to find ways of having the audience feel like they are discovering it rather than being told that that's what they should think and that's the thing i'm most interested in 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 directing something like this it's like it's like sculpting the attention of the viewer so that um, you, they feel like they are sort of present with almost complete access, but not total access. So there's still, there's still that last leap of trying to understand what's going on. And if you, if you can get a person into that kind of active watching space, the things that they see and discover are so much more powerful than if you just sort of, you know, pull back the curtain and present them with the, with the finished and digested story, you know? But to make that work, you've got to have a thing really out there in the world. You can, you know, and that's what Daisy and Paul gave me. They had this like brilliant chemistry, and then we could just like approach it quite glancingly, and you'd still really feel it. And that's much more powerful, I think. 
Um, we're about half an hour in here and we haven't actually spoken about what you're going to put in the OTB Culture Hall of Fame just yet. Yeah. Um, so uh, the OTB Culture Hall of Fame is brought to you in association with Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for on Now TV. Um, we've had various different things. Andy Lee picked Rocky Three. Dermot Kennedy picked Gladiator. Stephanie Preisner picked the US Office. We had Columbo by Paul Harris last week, um, which had the interesting bit of um, trivia that Steven Spielberg directed the first ever uh, network episode, which I didn't know. I didn't know that either. Um, you've gone for something which I hadn't heard of until you actually brought it to us this week. The Detectorists. Yes. So The Detectorists, I, I came upon it sort of by accident. Um, I saw Mackenzie Crook and um, Toby Jones um, still. Two, I love Toby Jones and I, I was interested in what Mackenzie Crook was doing post office. Post office. Post the office. And... Uh, Unless he's <laughs> delivering the mail, and um, and I just switched it on, and and from the moment it starts, there's a beautiful um, piece of music, um, and I have to, I have to, I can't find it at the moment, but I'll dig it out. It's the title track, and it's like a sort of British folk ballad, and that that sets the tone for the whole thing. Because I'll tell you, what it is is just two guys living in a small rural village uh, in England somewhere who are members of the local um, metal detecting club. And, and they go and they try and find bits of old, you know, Roman arrowheads or whatever, and with an idea that one day they might sort of unearth some fabulous piece of treasure. But, but really it's just a, a space in which you can watch them talking to each other. And they're both sort of a bit lost and they're both a bit sad, but it, it's beautiful. It's like, for me, it's like a more sophisticated, contemporary, and very beautifully made Last of the Summer Wine. And it kind of gives me a feeling of, I found it just really peaceful to watch as well as, it's funny, I mean, it's a comedy, but it's single camera comedy. And what that means is it feels like it's shot like a drama and it feel, it's very beautiful to watch. And it, I've always had this penchant for um, English folk, like, but like, across the range, like folk horror stuff, you know, like Wicker Man kind of territory, but also just folk um, music and the kind of countryside, which I find really fascinating. And I just, yeah, I just love it. It's, it's, um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's uh, very beautiful and, and really simple. And is there lots of it? Are there many seasons? Is it one season or? Two seasons, as far as I know. I'm not sure if there's going to be a third season. Um, and, uh, but, but it's, Definitely two seasons. And the Toby, um, Toby Jones character has this, um, you know, his, his ex lives in the village with her new partner. And he's very sort of uh, macho and, you know, everything that Toby isn't. And, but he's desperately um, dedicated to his wife and, and, and she uses him relentlessly for like errands and, and things. And he's always willing to sort of drop everything and help her, you know, even though she's with a new partner. Um, and it's it's just beautifully drawn. Um, I think I have a sort of uh, I love comedy. I mean, I, I've always had a you know I've, I've always loved watching good comedy. But the stuff which has just the right amount of pathos is is a it's a very delicious kind of combo. And I think uh, it's written by Mackenzie Crook, I think as well. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, just super impressive. That um, combination is something that we were speaking about with Louisa Harland on the show uh, a little while ago. I, I think it was actually in the context of Dairy Girls, to be honest with you. And uh, like, I haven't seen this show, but having looked at one clip on YouTube, you can kind of get the sadness that you mentioned and yeah. you can get how much you root for these characters. It's the clip I watch is when they find a piece of gold. Yes. I'm like, if I'm invested in this, I'm in floods oh, yeah. of tears watching this. T uh, totally, totally. And they... Uh, Toby's character um, plays a little bit of music and he writes a song for his ex and it's and it's a good song but it's also the whole thing is so dread like oh god you know it's so painful but it's beautiful and they you know it's 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 yeah I really really like it it's the sort of best of that character-based British um, kind of tradition which goes all the way back to musical and then comes up through the sitcoms into this slightly more sophisticated kind of contemporary version. Um, but it's right 
part of that tradition. And uh, I just, I, you know, I, most of the stuff I watch, um, you know, I don't, I don't watch things for comfort usually, uh, you know, I, I kind of, but, but this one I find very like a bam, you know, I just, I could watch an episode of it just to sort of make me feel the world is okay, which of course it isn't, but uh, <laughs> it's not bad to feel that once in a while. When you say you don't watch things for comfort, are you watching them with your professional eye then, or, or what are you watching them for? I think I'm w- m- mostly watching things for like that stimu- that sense of stimulation, you know, that thing that just, whatever it was that got me into films in the first place, that sense of something like that cuts through or that, or that, you know, for example, recently, I'm trying to think what I've been watching. Um, there's a great service called Mubi. I don't know if you uh, know it. It's like, they basically, there's 20 films available and then one drops off each day and a new one comes on. And it's by really interesting directors and, and like back catalog stuff as well. So things you might not otherwise see. So I might just go on to that and watch a, an old French film or a, um, an odd contemporary curiosity from somewhere else. And I just find that really, I love that stimulation. So that would be my normal kind of way of watching. But I do occasionally, and I watch with the kids, I watch uh, sometimes Outnumbered. I don't know if you ever, the BBC show, mm. Hugh, um, Hugh Dennis. And uh, it's just a family, it's a really well scripted family, kind of chaotic family. Um, sitcom really good uh, I like it because there's flailing parents and the kids <laughs> were watching that. Uh, I presume you haven't watched normal people with your kids yet <clears throat> is this a, a is this something at some point in your life you're gonna like sit down with them when they're like 25 and 30 well, and go I made this my daughter's um nine right going on 16 and she is in it. She's, she's got a small part. Like, so when Connell goes to the Debs uh, with Rachel, there's a little sister character, which is now my daughter. Right. And she, she wants to be an actress. And I was hoping that might put her off, but she's <laughs> really like it. And um, we said to her the other day, I said, okay, now I'll show you that bit. Right. And I can show you some of the other bits, but when it, when it comes to the sort of like, you know, um, sort of adult bits, we're going to have to skip on. And she said, her line was, where's the fun in that? She said. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I'm, yeah, I, um, I will be trying to, I mean, I, I, like when they're, when they're sort of, you know, 16, I think it'd be a good time to, I, I'd like to have seen something like that when I was that age. My son is, is like, he would run, you know, a hundred meters to get away from a sex scene. So he's 12, but I, I said that will change pretty soon, I would say. <laughs> Um, what was it like putting Trinity on uh, on TV for everybody to watch? What was that experience like as somebody who went there? It was nice, actually, because um, it's such a particular place. It's hard to shoot in Trinity. You know, it's like, it's quite, um, for, for obvious reasons, they're just very careful about letting people in. It's quite bureaucratic. And so you, there's that kind of slight thing on your shoulder all the time about how long you have. You know, you have to, to specify where you'll be at each point in the day. And so you've got all these mini deadlines. So it's not like a leisurely um, kind of, you know, trip down memory lane. I, I really enjoyed the the scouting because I got to we got to pick the places and I picked some places that were kind of significant to me, like parts of the library that I used to study in. And um, and it did then bring back being there like late in the evening and things like that did bring back memories. And I also like the fact that Trinity has been used quite a bit, but it's, it's almost always used as another like doubling for another institution somewhere else. Mm. So it was good to be able to show it as as itself. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed it. And I just enjoyed the sort of, it made me feel old because, you know, it doesn't feel like that long ago to me, but then you go back there and you just go, Jesus, you know, these, I can't believe how old I am, which is generally the experience of life past about 40 anyway, isn't it? That you just kind of constantly yeah. remind about how old you are. Does the can I, can I just ask on that? Does the content of normal people make you feel old? Do, do you do you kind of feel wistful for your youth while, while while shooting it? Yeah, I think I feel wistful in that particular way that all, I think much longing has, which is hmm. you're actually wistful for something that you didn't quite have. You know, like I don't think I ever, I never let myself. I was never as honest as the characters are with each other when I was that age. I was definitely too sort of caught up in myself and 
I think there were definitely relationships that I had then that I could have, that could have been fantastic, but that I was probably the reason that they were curtailed, you know? Um, but it does make me, it does remind me of the energy of that age and of the kind of, I don't know, the sort of, and, and that, that, you know, you look at children, it's even more extreme, that sort of sensory openness that, that, that you have, but just the emerging into a new phase of life is such an exciting time. And that's, pro that, that, you know, having kids probably is the, is, is the, is the last of that, or one of the last of those, that's a, that's a truly kind of expanding thing. Most of the rest of it is a kind of gradual, uh, you know, shrinking again. And I, I, so I think probably it did make me feel, I mean, wistful and, 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 and for some aspects of it and, and longing for some aspects of it, but also quite glad that some of the aspects of it are over, you know, the tremendous self kind of analysis that goes on and the, the, the sort of, um, you know, that, that kind of fraught, um, those fraught relationships that you have in your early twenties. And I don't miss aspects of it, but some I do for sure. Whenever uh, Connell was given out about people in his English tutorial not reading the book, I was like, oh my God, that's us. That, that was our English tutorial right there. We, we, we had a couple of Connells in our class who were brilliant and, and did all read the books, but there was a story in our WhatsApp group immediately afterwards of somebody who was in one of those tutorials in English and Trinity who had um, borrowed notes on a book he was due to present on. And the class started and they went to him and said, right, your turn. And he opened the notes that he borrowed and he couldn't read the writing. <laughs> so he had to confess to not being able to read his own writing to the tutorial. And the tutor was like, I mean, I'm not really sure I believe this. Uh, but there was a few of God. But, you know, it's just yeah. to say, well, well you maybe just summarize your thoughts. If you, you know, don't read them exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The book was good, I think. Thanks very much. So uh, it was triggering in many aspects. Uh, yeah. But I think it brings a lot of energy too, right? That's, the, mm. that's like immersing yourself in this and understanding this world. And how you've escaped from it, I hope, by the time you're in your 40s. Yeah, for sure. And actually, just the thing, it's, I feel so, you know, again, it's a total cliche, but I feel really lucky to do the work because you get to visit these parts of life that, you know, it's such a, it's like you, you, every project brings you to some um, part of the world or of life or of corner of yourself or other people that you wouldn't otherwise get to visit. It's an amazing privilege to be able to do that. And look, to wrap this up, would you be interested? Is it possible that there could be a second season? I mean, we did, we, we've never talked about like a direct second season, but one thing that has popped up and floated around every so often is, and, and this would go back to your point about the before series, would be to vi revisit the two of them in five or 10 years, mm. which I think would be really interesting because I think there are such great characters, there's such kind of well-drawn characters and they exist now and it feels like there's got to be something really interesting to say with those characters um after life has sort of taken its toll for a number of years to see what that looks like so yeah. that, who knows that might happen i think in the before series of paints youth is a very exciting thing your late 20 or late 20s early 30s is a decent thing and then marriage is absolutely horrific i know so maybe normal people could follow the exact same path i'm not sure Maybe we try and turn that around and <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, God, let's hope. Lenny, always great to have you with us. Thanks so much for making the time. Total pleasure. And thanks for, for having me and for all the interest in, in the, in the show. Really appreciate it. It's been brilliant. Thanks a million. So that's this week's uh, OTD Culture Hall of Fame brought to you in association with Now TV, where you can stream every episode of the unmissable new show, Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Path, which also has a 14 day free trial that you can avail of. The OTB Culture Hall of Fame. Brought to you by Now TV. Watch whatever you're in the mood for.